Before I jump into my remarks on, on uh, digital forensics and, and where we're at today, where I think this field needs to go, and maybe a couple of thoughts about how we get there, I wanted to share with you that we're all on a journey. And back a long time ago, in about the year 1776, right after the American Revolution, my five times and four times great-grandfather had just gotten out of the Revolutionary Army uh, fighting on the American side under George Washington. And they went back home to Rhode Island. And what they found is that their property really didn't exist the way that it did before the war. None of their stuff was there. They didn't have jobs and the economy was in tatters. So my five times and four times great-grandfather, which was his son, they uh, decided to uh, migrate the family out to uh, upstate New York. And they did that on the request of a handbill that was being circulated at the time by a very prominent family in upstate New York that said, for Revolutionary War veterans, you can come out here and we're gonna give you land from our, from our enormous estate and you're gonna farm that land and you're gonna prosper. And this is pretty typical for, for Revolutionary War veterans. So my grandfathers, they got on the road and uh, they traveled. And uh, family history says that the road that they traveled is the Boston Post Road. And I'm sure all of you know what the Boston Post Road is because it runs right next to the University of New Haven. And I'm pretty sure that some 225, 30 years ago, my five times and four times great-grandfather, and for my son Andrew, his six times and five times great-grandfather would have never imagined that we'd be sitting here traveling that same road on a journey of our own. So uh, I thought that it was uh, really neat to, to be able to share that and, uh, and just to show you that uh, you know, we're, all on a, we're all on a journey. And so in digital forensics, we're also on a journey. And I shared some comments uh, in, in the, my remarks this morning about uh, some of the journeys that I'm on in terms of research. But I want to kind of step back from that for a little while and talk to you about how I see this world today. What I see in, in my experience uh, when looking at digital forensics is, is I see kind of a fractured community. And let me explain what I mean. I've not worked in digital forensic science for very long, although I've worked in the cybersecurity domain for quite some time now. When I come to digital forensics, it's, it's a little different. It's a little different than uh, where I came from in the network defense uh, specialization. Network defense is a specialization that, like digital forensics, is pretty prescriptive. There are lots of capabilities that exist in that world. There's enormous amounts of investment in that world because as you, as you see every day in the news media, we have a tremendous number of issues in governments worldwide and corporations and other entities that have networks that are being uh, compromised or hacked by any number of other entities around the world. Um, so that world faces a big problem, and I think collectively it's really trying to solve those problems, and not just solve it through analysis, but solve it through process. And, and we do the same thing in the digital forensics community. My exposure to digital forensics community is a little eye-opening, because it is really its own subspecialization under the cybersecurity umbrella. I work uh, at an organization that runs a large forensic laboratory. And this laboratory, like others uh, that, that uh, specialize in this field, we don't know what's going to walk in the door. Uh, when we think about intrusions, we kind of know what's going to walk in the door. We kind of know what to look for, for the most part. We look at network traffic. We look at endpoint boxes. We look at applications and how they behave. We watch people uh, and try to figure out what they're trying to do uh, to get into your organization. There's quite a bit of, uh, of warning of, of what might be coming at your organization. And so therefore, you can take 
uh, the, the necessary posture that your organization needs to, to kind of stand up and, and improve your resilience. On the digital forensic side though, we generally don't know what's going to walk in the door. That's actually a lot of fun, but at the same time, it's very difficult. And so I talked about kind of that fractured approach. And it's, it's really not a bad thing, it's just what happens. Because you don't know what's going to walk in the door as, as a practitioner in this field, it's hard to prepare. Uh, it's hard to go to your organization, to, your, you know, to, to the people you work for, the people that invest into your organization, and tell them what they need to invest in in the future. Uh, you don't know if you're going to work a murder case. You don't know if you're going to work a fraud case. You don't know if you're going to work a crimes against children's case. You just don't know. You don't know what kind of technology is going to come in the door in that next case. You don't know if a new IoT device is going to come in uh, that was just released yesterday and was used in, 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 some, in some criminal capacity. You don't know how the technology works. You don't know how the data is formatted on the device. You don't know maybe there's some specialized encryption that's being used on the device. You just don't know. I got a tour uh, from Peter the other night about uh, a project that he's working on, which I encourage all of you to go take a look at. In, uh, and, and so the thought is, you know, how can you run attacks and how can you do forensics uh, in the um, in the virtual reality space. Again, you don't know as a forensic scientist when a virtual reality system is going to walk in the door into your laboratory. You don't know how it's going to be used by criminals. Uh, and that's really across the you know, criminal enterprise space. You, know, you don't know if it's going to be used for sex crimes or for fraud crimes or, or anything else. But what you have to be able to do is you have to be able to take that system and you have to be able to understand it, usually quickly, because there's typically a bottom line in every organization. And you have to be able to analyze the data. And you have to be able to then uh, you know, write some sort of technical analysis on what you observed. And then you may have to go to court and defend your analysis. Those are hard things. Because we don't know what's going to walk in the door, it's hard for our community to coalesce around a single problem like what we do in intrusions analysis. We know in intrusions analysis, and we have a couple folks here who, uh, who have some experience in that world, that we can build sensors that collect massive amounts of network traffic at certain points in your infrastructure. We can run uh, decoders. We can create decoders to, you know, to look at, at new types of enc encoded traffic. And we can pretty rapidly pivot through that traffic. We can pull files out of traffic. We can reverse files. So there's been a tremendous amount of pipelining, uh, uh, reverse engineering techniques to be able to rapidly understand what's going on in the network space. How do you pipeline digital forensic processes to be able to handle that? One of the things that I've noticed recently, and I, and I worked with uh, with Rob here on a project. And Rob's project was to build custom parsers for Android devices. And so he's building parsers in a, in a very popular uh, framework for, for doing this. And it occurred to me that right now we have folks who have been trained in in uh, reverse engineering these applications to build custom parsers. And that parser might be good for a week, a day, a month, maybe a couple months at most. And so we can pipeline parsers. But once the developers of these applications make a change, the parser doesn't work anymore. And we run into that problem a little bit too on the, on the network traffic side. So I've been exposed in the last year or so to a concept called DevOps. Are you guys familiar with DevOps? OK, so DevOps at a very high level, I'll just kind of ex explain it to you the way that I really understand it, is that a development organization is given a goal. And that goal says, we have a web application, for example, that is customer facing. And those customers, they all need something a little bit different. They have different desires about how they might use this application or how it might get better. And uh, typically, your development organizations will say, OK, I have a big build. 
we're going to test this big build, and we're going to eventually put it into production. And that big build might make a 10% change to our application. Now let's just imagine what we could do instead of saying we're going to do one or two big builds a year and integrate that into our, into our customer facing application. What if we wanted to push new builds, but really small builds, to that web application every day that were tested, that were documented, that have gone through cybersecurity review processes, that have been through you know, business review processes, and all the other processes that an organization might have before they put something public. What if we could do that? That's where DevOps comes in. DevOps is an approach to say, we're going to put a new build into production every day. You, know, you look at Facebook or you look at uh, Twitter, for example, Amazon. These guys are pushing an enormous amount of updates. And you may not even really notice that it's going on, but a lot of it's going on behind the scenes. And so I was thinking about, you know, coming back to this parser discussion, I was thinking about what these companies that are building these, these Android applications that Rob was focused on, what kind of process do they have going to build these applications? And I said, hmm, these are all companies that have adopted DevOps in their, in their uh, development process. That's why we're seeing so many of these little tiny incremental changes that change these applications that we're trying to build parsers for. Right, so, so here's the problem when it comes to that space. Companies have enormous investments into their development process to update your Facebook application, your Twitter application that you, you, know, you have on your mobile device. And our community doesn't have the opposite of that. So let's just imagine now that our community, so developers like Rob, could be set up in a DevOps a purposely built DevOps environment to build parsers. Now let's imagine that the parser comes out, put it on his phone, I go commit a crime using that, there's some data evidence of that crime within the, uh, the application or the database itself. But now let's just think through that. How long does it take for us to build a new parser? How much does it cost to build a new parser to go find the data that we're looking for because the application has changed. What's important to me is that as a community, we really start thinking about how we bridge this gap. So if we know that the development community has adopted DevOps, why can't the digital forensic science community also adopt DevOps? That's just as an example because we're going to continuously be outpaced by the folks that are writing the applications. That's just the way it is. Those applications make a lot of money, and unfortunately, we spend money, you know, chasing, ch 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 you know, chasing these details down, and um, that's a problem. That's a problem that we have today. That really kind of talks about where we're at now, where we need to go, and kind of how we get there. And that's just one. That's one little space. You know, that's. Android parsers. Now we can, we can also think about how adopting DevOps might help us in, in other contexts, you know, developing software in our community as well. But when we, uh, when we think about this problem in terms of a business case, we have to realize that we can't continue presenting the same cost to our employers. It's never a good thing. Right? We want to drive costs down. Just like your Facebooks and your Googles and your Amazons have been trying to drive cost out of their development process so they can reallocate their engineers to other projects, we need to think the same way on, on our side. I wanted to talk about the analysis side of this because this is really one of the areas that I'm most interested in right now. As I mentioned earlier, you don't know what's going to come in the door. And because you don't know what's going to come in the door next for your next investigation, 
you have to kind of just be prepared for anything. That's hard. That's expensive. That takes a lot of time. And in my remarks earlier, I shared with you uh, an observation about kind of the average case. Right? So the average case that I've seen will have two phones. Each phone might have 30,000 images. So you have 60,000 images and videos from two phones that have been submitted for whatever, you know, whatever kind of crime may have been committed. How long does it take once you have the data, once you've gotten it off the phone, you fixed that phone and you got it off? How long does it take to review those images, to, images to, and videos to understand the context that maybe an investigator is looking for, or if you are an investigator, to find leads uh, to help your investigative process? Well, the answer is it, it takes a long time. And that time costs money. And the longer things take, the longer the investigation goes. If somebody's being abused, that person may be getting abused longer. When it comes to automation and automating analysis, this is an area where I think we need to put an enormous amount more of our efforts as a community uh, in areas like neural networks. Because these communities that create this science, if, if, we don't, if we don't actively embrace those other communities, we're going to keep doing things the way that we've been doing things, manually, manual forensic processes. And they may be, and they may be forensically sound processes. And they, may, and they may be defensible processes when you go, if you have to go to court. But when you have 60,000 images, or in five years you have 160,000 images, and in eight years you have a million images that you have to look at per device. Our brains don't get that much faster. Our manual review processes by clicking through images don't get any faster. So we have to do something else. Our, the cost of our services can't just keep going up. Because our employers won't, you know, they're, they're, they're not going to be interested in, in uh, cost increases every year for your services. That's one of the areas that I'm focused on right now is trying to employ these new technologies to do image and video analysis so that we can help investigators and forensic examiners be able to understand the context of what's in an image without necessarily having to look at the image. Now, there are some issues there when it comes to having you know, scientifically sound and defensible process. But we have to start asking these kinds of questions in our community. And it's OK. It's OK to still have your manual forensically sound processes while also being inquisitive and asking, how can we make these better and faster and cheaper for, for our employers? How can we turn these large data set types, types of cases around faster so that we can generate leads to either take bad guys off the street uh, or prove the innocence of somebody who's in custody or maybe perhaps to even protect somebody who's being abused. That's where I think this world needs to go. That's where you guys come in. As I mentioned earlier, you're here at UNH and you don't have a lot of rules on you. You really can think about problems from 20 or 50 or 100 different vantage points. But one year, or, or at some point in the future, when you go work and you're working in a laboratory or a law enforcement entity or a corporate investigations entity, you're going to have a lot of rules. Your organization is going to impose them on you. Things like change. How do I change technology? How do I adapt processes? How do I, how do I invent new ways to be leaner, faster, cheaper within context of my corporate legal counsel? 
and their, their understanding of our field. Those are hard problems. And those are problems that you're going to come to these workplaces with new training and new worldviews. And you have to express those. So I'd encourage you, don't walk in on your first day and say, I'm just going to chill for the next five years. And I'm just going to do exactly what my boss tells me. Yes, you should do what your boss tells you. But that's always good employment advice. But you need to consistently be inquisitive. You should always ask questions about, why do we do it this way? And when somebody tells you, because that's the way we've always done it, you need to think again. Because there's probably a better way to do things. But it's up to you, those of you that are coming out of the university with new skills and new worldviews, to come change the world. And the journey of that organization includes you, just like it does here. You know, when you go work for Fortune 500 companies or for government agencies, they're already on a journey. There's already a big speeding train going. And they may, you know, they may have certain processes that you walk in and you say, wow, you know what? When I was at UNH, we proved a way that we could do things 100 times faster. And so maybe you're going to reach back and you're going to pull out that research paper, that project, or maybe one of these posters you have on the wall. And you're going to come and beg Abe, hey, Abe, can I have that? Unencrypted data and Android social messaging applications uh, white paper we have up on the wall. You, you know the one that we made right, two years ago? I need that to create a business case for my employer to invest a couple of dollars so we can improve our process by 100 times. Right? You got to draw on those resources. That's how you're successful along your own journey. That's how you enable success in the organizations that you work with. But we have to adapt. We have to keep adapting in this field. What I'm not seeing is enough people coming into this field that have a cryptography background or understand the ways that cryptography can be applied in, in, in lots of different use cases. I don't see a lot of study in this field. And I think that's really important. Because one day, I think that cryptography, along with the data analysis, are going to be our two hardest problems. Uh, for example, how do you take a phone that has been purposely engineered around a secure boot method? And how do you get in the middle of that so that you can get data that you need for your, for your investigation? How, how do you handle that? Well, today, we just kind of throw our hands up. But that can't always be the answer in our field. Because if it is, we're, our field's not going to get the kinds of investment that we need. The schools may walk away from this kind of stuff you know, just because the technology itself is getting stronger in terms of uh, resiliency. Now, how do, we, how do we get through that process? Well, I think that those of you that are in academia right now have to understand the problems that we're running into as examiners and investigators and really start thinking about this problem. And the problem's not real simple in terms of, well, it's just encryption. There's, there's a lot of issues. There's a lot of underlying issues there. There's a lot of underlying issues uh, that are both legal and technological. And we, we, we have to ask a lot of questions about, about all of those surrounding issues around encryption. Because when you hit the workplace, you should be well versed in all of those problems so that you can interact with all of your counterparts, with your management, with your legal counsel, with your customers, and be able to help all of your counterparts understand why things may be too technically difficult right now. You may be able to get investment in your organization to pursue new ways to interrogate these kinds of uh, hardened architectures. Are we going to, you know, all of a sudden one day solve this problem? 
Probably not. I think that, that what we're going to do is what we're going to see is that this problem is going to keep evolving. And so we have to evolve right along with it. Just like building parsers for Android apps and uh, trying to adopt uh, development practices from commercial organizations uh, in our development of parsers, we probably have some lessons to be learned from the cryptography world uh, in terms of trying to defeat or bypass uh, what they're creating and, and, and what, they're, uh, what they're using to implement uh, secure capabilities. You know, because criminals are, are happy. You know, they're happy if they can have properly implemented cryptography. Because then they're safe. They just have to make a mistake somewhere else that we have to pick up. Uh, but again, it's a problem that's going to keep evolving. So I'd encourage all of you, while you're here at New Haven, and even in the future, to, to really think about this problem, uh, to explore potential new paths for our, for our, for our community uh, that we can take to, uh, you know, to try to defeat or bypass these, these kinds of capabilities. From my experience, it's really vision. It, it's, it, it's a matter of having somebody like you or I stand up in our organization and say, hey, there's some good ideas outside of our field that I think we need to try. Uh, so for example, if your job all day long is to sit in a laboratory and build mobile app parsers, and you don't know what app is going to come in next, but you're under pressure to help turn these investigations quickly, otherwise they're expensive. If you don't come in and lead with vision, it'll never happen. Right? That's, where, that's where all of you are, are going to make a difference. You have to go into your organizations, your future employers, and develop vision. And don't, don't be afraid of leading. It's going to be uncomfortable, for sure. But once you have that vision, get behind it and get other people behind it. And before you know it, you will have something to automatically develop parsers for mobile apps within one day of them being published for all, you know, for all mobile apps. That's what our community needs. You know, it's hard, but that's what we need. You know, imagine that you can be a forensic examiner anywhere in the world, and you can go to a library, and you can say, hey, I need, uh, you know, mobile app parser for this platform, for this Pac-Man application, which is being used to hide some, some data that's used, that, that has some context about a, about a criminal activity. And you could just pull this down. Maybe there's some automatic generating capability behind the scenes to, to create all those. We're not there yet. But, but again, I think that that's something that our community needs. Uh, so you know, we, have, we have to continually think about those issues and also think about ways that we can approach these issues. Because at some point, there'll probably be somebody, you know, maybe in this room, maybe Rob, who will we'll invent this. And, uh, you know, don't, so don't be afraid of, of sharing and leading with big, bold ideas because you'll be successful in the long term. But if we don't talk about these kinds of things openly in our community, we're never going to get there, right? So, like I said, in 10 years, every phone you process, you're going to manually look at a million images. Why? And then that's going to take you three or four weeks to do that's going to cost your organization, let's say, $10,000. That's going to cost your customer $20,000 know, once your company makes profit off of, off of the transaction. Where does it stop? You know, so in, uh, in, you know, as technologists, really, you know, really we're all technologists in here, if, if we don't think about how we can adapt technologies from other fields to our field, we're going to keep doing things the same way we're doing them today. And that's a great thing about you know, the artificial intelligence community. 
is, and I know they have a lot of problems on their own too. And there's a lot to figure out. You know, they're trying to mimic the human brain. Very, very, very hard problem. Um, but we're getting there, slowly, slowly. And by the time you reach the end of your career, maybe we'll have a lot of it figured out and we'll have brand new problems to go along with it too.